Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, welcome, everybody. That, that's that's by far the most packed up meetup that I've ever been in. <laughs> uh, and the food was fantastic, so I think that's the reason. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's start from here. How many people here know about this book or read this book? Well, well, minority. Okay. That's going to be a big message for all the other people that didn't raise their hand. And uh, let me tell, tell you something about this book. It's, uh, to me, it's one of the, the things that is uh, clearing, uh, setting a clean uh, demarcation between uh, before and after. Why is that? Because, uh, because it's not a book about technical thing. It's a book about uh, a survey that was done with uh, scientific principle and uh, collecting evidences which are large enough to give us uh, some answers which are not like uh, based on anecdotal data. Like when trying to uh, introduce changes in a software organization, one of the problem is uh, you only have storytelling from consultants and, a lot, and nothing is, uh, well, I need data to make sure this is, this is true. And of course it doesn't work because, uh, I mean, not a single company could have uh, uh, yeah, a very scientific way to prove that something is actually working. You don't hire twins and put them in two parallel teams with the same backlog and, and see if the project is uh, having better or wrong, wrong results at the end. So we cannot have real science. It's just like based on experiments and an anecdotal evidence. Work for me doesn't mean that it's work for, for other people. But uh, on a large sample, okay, then we have statistical data. And so we have uh, science behind uh, lean software development, DevOps, and a few other practices. Okay, that's for the introduction. What is the science saying? Well, the first thing actually was born inside the community, just like a combination of uh, uh, Nicole Fosgren, that uh, is a PhD researcher, and Gene Kim and Jess Humble, which are the, the engines of the DevOps community. Surprising, the first thing but uh, they, they say it like uh, the approach called DevOps, whatever DevOps might mean, is actually working. They observe that some traits are actually strictly connected with uh, how successful the organization implementing this were. Okay, we need a little bit more of explanation about what is DevOps. And uh, the ingredients of this definition was frequent code deployments, fast lead time from commit, commit to deploy, and fast recovery from downtime. I mean, if something goes wrong in production, how much time is it needed to recover the things and put them back in order? And also the lower change failure rate. We are doing new stuff, how many times uh, the new change is, uh, is happening uh, without, uh, without problems. It's also more interesting if you take a quick look at the numbers, uh, because the numbers are telling a lot about the distance. Like uh, frequent code deployments, the faster organization are doing deployment up to 46 times more frequently. So is, uh, we're talking about multiple releases uh, happening sometimes in a single day, and, uh, but the distance between uh, the fast performer and the slow performance is actually striking. People at this organization are not 20% faster, 46 times more frequently. Or even worse, when you, when you look at the lead time from com commit to deploy, the fast organization can be up to 400 times faster. So we're not even in the same league for some, uh, some areas. Fast recovery from downtime, these are the numbers, 170 times, and the five times lower change failure rate. Like, yeah, I'm a lot more reliable. That is great, DevOps is working. So, well, that's a quick solution. Just hire DevOps, what is the problem? <laughs> that, that's what company might, might, be, might be doing. Okay, just hire them. Easy thing. Let's talk about microservices instead. And uh, microservices in the same book, just like more frequently adopted between high performance. So it looks like a good, this type of architecture, there's some correlation, but it's not really a strong causation. No significant differences according to which type of architecture teams were building or integrating against. So microservices by themselves were not enough to say like, okay, we're going microservices and our organization is gonna get a lot, uh, a lot better. And this is actually kind of pairing with some of the things that I, uh, that I heard uh, from, uh, this is an actual conversation with, uh, with a friend working a lot in microservices environment. And uh, 
he was uh, participating to this microservices uh, conference and then, uh, well, hand raising, who, who in this room is doing even driven microservices? And he was just like looking for friends and, uh, and, uh, and everybody else was doing microservices in I don't know which, which other way. And uh, that's another story from uh, another consultant. This, this guy is Italian instead. And they said, like, uh, well, this is what I'm doing most of the time. Customers are calling me to coordinate microservices deployment, which is kind of nonsense uh, if you consider that microservice was a unit of independent deployment and you want to make it as small as possible and then coordinate everything in a single larger unit. What is the point? doesn't make any sense. So I, I kind of realized that behind this microservices wave, I can say uh, we have these uh, good old friends, like uh, microservices are just like SOA. I mean, at least half of the people in this room would have said something like this, but the underlying message in some organization is actually we screwed up SOA, we can just uh, screw up microservices exactly in the same way. And uh, it's not a technology. It's, uh, the technology is, is, uh, will, will help. Actually, there's a lot of good things behind microservices done in a given way, but it's not enough. And so, and so this, why do I say scary? Because uh, actually microservices without a given uh, approach, without a given reasoning behind the boundaries and what are we doing, could actually probably be the end of civilization, like putting us in a place where refactoring back from bad choices is going to be a lot more expensive, and we already run out of budget by going microservices. So, yeah, maybe, yeah, that, that's not a nice place to be. Anyway, uh, the, the point, getting back to the book, is just like uh, the relevance of the technology was, is not as much as important as... Uh, some people would like, well, just go microservices and make it everything easy. No, it's not. But, but looks like one of the key differentiators for uh, the performance of the organization in the architectural space is, uh, well, enforcement of loose coupling. So coming from a domain-driven design background, what are we talking about is much more in the space of bounded context, independent model, design around the idea of have the, the minimum amount of coupling between, uh, between uh, the, different, uh, the different boundaries. And uh, if, we are, if we are thinking in, uh, I mean, there's something that will feel like a disconnect at this moment, like uh, let's, let's make it uh, visible. Weren't microservices and loosely coupled intended to be the same thing, more or less? That was one of the ideas. And, uh, and I, would say, I would say no, there's, uh, there's uh, yeah, kind of uh, the major mistake, what I think might be really, really scary is, uh, well, the attitude of uh, maybe following some tutorial, looking at, uh, yeah, we have this database table, let's make a microservices around it, maybe the customer service, and then, yeah, deploy it independently, and suddenly, Everybody's depending from this microservice and we need to coordinate deployment. And I'd say like, uh, this is a very, very scary way to go. So as a friendly reminder for the future, I'm moving to a new topic, but uh, I'll turn my monolith entities in, into microservices. Please don't do that. And we can have a lot of beers talking about, uh, talking about this problem. I could go for the, for the whole night. Because, because I want to move to one more thing. And at the end, like a Gordian knot, everything is going to be connected. The third factor that was relevant in the, in the book is, uh, is culture. And it uh, looks like there was a correlation between the, the, the emergent culture inside the organization and the actual result it could achieve. And that was one of the other really, really dominant factor in, in this scenario. The book provided a classification. Here I'm really going out to my field. I'm still a software architect, even if I am also, yeah, coach, facilitator, and run my own company so I could call myself an entrepreneur. But in my background is software engineering anyway. So talking about culture, OK, this is uh, a little bit out of my field. So my small summary, just like uh, power oriented, you do things this way because I told you I'm your boss. Bureaucratic, we follow the rules. Generative. Whatever is working is fine. This, uh, the more you move into the uh, startup area, the more you go down. And this is uh, one of the places where the, there's a strong correlation of generative uh, uh, culture type uh, 
looks like it's, work, uh, it's working uh, better than other approaches. But as I said, I am not a sociologist. Uh, the term culture is, uh, is really not, uh, not really well defined for me. And also, the moment people start talking about culture is, uh, uh, for me, this is where the things are getting weird. I'll, I'll be more explicit. So um, one thing that I'm good at is, uh, uh, I'm, I, I call myself sometimes a bullshit sommelier. So I'm really good in uh, mm, smelling it in, uh, at this level. I, I, I don't know if it, uh, it, it's recorded too late. And anyway, uh, one of the things for me is just that this culture is a given. There's nothing we can do about it. Well, you know, well, that's a common mentality. That's, I, I really hate the word mentality in many places. Oh, this is how we do things. You cannot change them because, uh, well, that's the current culture. And, uh, and the other thing that I really don't like is uh, when uh, the cultural thing is seen as something completely independent from our profession. The culture is something which is the result of uh, somebody else's action, not ours. We're not part of the culture. We're always victim of, of the culture, or anyway, it's not our job. But in whose job it is? And uh, in so many places, culture is just like uh, given or emergent, and then uh, we have nothing to do about it. And this is where I freak out, because I would like to solve things. And if people are telling me, oh, this is a cultural problem, OK, good, that's a cultural problem. How do we solve it? And um, in order to do this, I basically made my engineer-like uh, definition of what the culture is. It's not precise. It's, uh, it's just actionable. So I'm not a sociologist. I'm not an anthropologist. I don't know what culture is, but I need an actionable definition for this space, which is culture is a cumulative effect of a winning behavior with, within a given context. Let me see if I can make it actionable. And, uh, and the combo in many places where we actually manage to make uh, big changes, winning examples and imitation, Oh, everybody's doing this now. It just looks from out, uh, like a culture from the outside. I'm going to give you an example, and, uh, which is a little journey into stereotypes. Talking about bus tickets. And uh, this is a bus that is more or less the same type that, that used to be in, uh, um, in Bologna, where I started. And it was uh, funny, one of my, co one of my colleagues um, at the university, actually, well, scientific approach, wanted to check if... Uh, it was worth paying the ticket. So for an entire year, he decided to take the bus and not to pay the ticket and see what happened. And at the end of the year, he said, like, uh, I'm never going to pay the ticket anymore. I was fined only three times. I paid the bills, and it's still less than half of the money needed to pay the, the entire subscription. <laughs> Data, science, we have, the, we have the answers. But if you look at the shape of this bus, there's a few things that might be interesting, like, uh, um, you have to buy the ticket before going on the bus. And you could get on the bus from each one of these doors, and, uh, and you're not supposed to talk with the driver. So in order to check that you have the ticket, uh, well, there were controllers. But we knew them. There was a man with the big mustache. There was the, 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 the other fat guy. I mean, we knew each one of them. They had to be in two or three together, blocking the three doors at the same time. I mean, just like it was a narcos type of uh, action, just to uh, grab some, uh, some, some tickets from uh, university students. Uh, so I was the one paying all the tickets uh, just to make sure, because I, I needed to be the other side of the scientific experiment. Um, <laughs> but anyway, we, we had the data, and we, we saw that uh, Talking about the winning behavior, it was an easy thing. Like, uh, tickets can be purchased in shopping vending machines. You cannot buy the ticket on the bus. Uh, multiple entry points, uh, because, uh, well, for Italians, you're expected to move people in and out quickly. Easy to jump on without a ticket. Nobody's looking at you. And cheating was really low-risk activity at the end. OK. Then, well, I traveled. I went into some other places. And uh, I went in places where uh, you make the ticket in the front door, you actually can buy the ticket on the bus. Or even better, this is, this is from Amsterdam. I was there a couple of weeks ago. In Amsterdam, you have the long, the long bus with the, the driver at the front and the person making tickets at the center. And you can only get in from the center. And one day was running. We were running, uh, got in at the front door, and we were going to 
pay our ticket, but the driver at the same time was, uh, was saying in the, the microphone, the, the loudspeakers, like, gentlemen, the tickets, please.